I am very happy and honored to introduce Richard Armstrong, the director of the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum and Foundation. Thank you, Paul. I'm happy to be here, thanks to Delta Airlines. <laughs> a little bit late, but um, it's a happy occasion. As Paul says, I grew up in Kansas City and came here frequently, always losing in basketball to Cadasco and Burroughs. But uh, it's a city that uh, I have great fondness for and great respect for. And this institution is one of the manifestations of its forward-looking spirit, which is now more than 100 years old at least. So tonight I'm going to talk about the Guggenheims, which is the umbrella lecture that says something about the family, since I think in families that organize museums like the Whitney Museum or other such institutions, the family's point of view manifests itself over and over, almost like a DNA. And then I thought I would expand that by showing you um, the family of museums that also exist under that <clears throat> trademark or brand name or umbrella or great global enterprise that I inherited. Uh, I had lived in Pittsburgh for 16 years and thought that that was sort of heaven on earth, but even heaven gets boring after a while. So it was uh, a moment that I decided about five years ago that I should leave Pittsburgh going back to New York not really knowing what to do. And by serendipity, the people at the Guggenheim gave me a call up. And I'm a Whitney Museum guy, so that was going into enemy territory. <clears throat> but we had a number of conversations. And I gradually became converted to that institution's point of view that art offers our world, can offer our world, a number of physical and uh, psycho-spiritual sites to talk about high cultural ideas in an exchange that really could be the counterpart to our typical obsession with borders and trade deficits and weaponry. So I say sometimes facetiously and sometimes with a lot of resignation, I'm the only museum director who also has a foreign policy. But tonight I'll show you how that sort of operates by beginning with this great slide of the museum, which I think you know well, situated on Fifth Avenue against the wishes of Frank Lloyd Wright, who hoped that it would be in uh, upper Manhattan at a place that people were obliged to drive to because he was obsessed with automobiles. And Robert Moses, the great city planner of New York at that era, was by accident Frank Lloyd Wright's cousin through the wives. So they referred to each other as Cousin Frank and Cousin Robert. And these two gentlemen conspired to make the museum happen at very remote places. The family finally put its foot down and said, no, we're hopeful that it can be in Manhattan and in upper Manhattan at a place that has great charms to it, as you may have seen. It actually is a sort of beachfront property. We look out over the reservoir. Here's the uh, founder of the dynasty. This is Meyer. Guggenheim, who came to Philadelphia in 1848, as a lot of Germans did. Uh, his family actually had left Germany in the course of the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century and moved to uh, the place outside Zurich where Jews were allowed to live. So this is the Langnau Valley, and he became very prosperous in that area, but decided in the 1840s that his family, which was growing, deserve bigger opportunities, and like many other Swiss and many other Germans and some Jews, because it's a very early moment for a Jewish family to emigrate, they came to Philadelphia. And the family made its way uh, doing, selling pins and needles and wooden clothing pins, and in particular, stove polish. Because if you were uh, a well-meaning and prideful housewife in the 19th century, one of the indices of your industry and perfection is that your stove is always black. So it called for a polish about every two or three days. And he took over a sausage factory, which allowed him to make more stove polish. This is Mr. Guggenheim. Uh, 
and eventually, with the help of some Quaker friends, made an investment in a silver mine in Leadville, Colorado. I know some people here know where Colorado is, and what you may not know is that Leadville is the biggest uh, discovery of silver in North America. So this mine, which he put all of his capital into in a very speculative way, which was underwater, which is where that phrase come from, he had to go there from Philadelphia, pump water out of the mine, and only three months later they discovered this giant vein. From that source, he eventually built the biggest uh, refining and smelting operation in the world called ASARCO, American Smelting and Refining Company, which at one moment controlled almost all the copper in North America and a great deal of the copper around the world, not to mention silver and many other metals. He had seven sons. This is number five, Solomon R. Guggenheim, born in 1861, died in 1949. He was considered the conciliatory child and brought the family to the table with a number of discussions from other landowners, smelters, miners around the world. They really took the operation outside of America very, very early. So by the 1880s, they were well known in Mexico and eventually controlled the Anaconda Pit in Alaska, which gave them a great copper fortune. Like many uh, aspiring people, he made a collection and uh, the family moved from Philadelphia to New York, so he married into the Rothschild family, bond traders, and had a fancy house on the North Shore of Long Island, and he bought a lot of not very interesting Barbizon pictures, which is the way a lot of collectors begin by not quite knowing what it is that they like and being victimized by dealers. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, well into his life, he met this woman, Hilla Rabe, who's uh, a minor aristocrat from Alsatia, and she had, was commissioned by Mrs. Guggenheim to paint Mr. Guggenheim's portrait, but she became a better friend than that and eventually convinced him that he should get rid of all the bad French paintings, instead begin investing in German paintings, essentially. She'd been on the fringes of the Bauhaus before World War II, and she knew personally Kandinsky and a number of other important abstract painters. She convinced Guggenheim really to begin a new life very late in his own life. So in the 1930s, the collection took shape and eventually Guggenheim owned about 140 paintings by Kandinsky, the biggest holdings outside of Europe. And he began inviting people to visit the, his apartment in the Plaza Hotel which ironically is where Franklin Wright would live many years later as he was completing the Guggenheim Museum. So one would visit the Guggenheim collection in the Plaza Hotel. He had a big shooting plantation in South Carolina and the first time he brought the collection together in 1936 was in Charleston. And then in 1937 he founded the Solomon R. Guggenheim Foundation. And the next year this museum opened called the Museum of Non-Objective Painting, which was a phrase that Hilla Rabe made up because her English was a little spotty. It's a great German phrase, not so good in English. This was on 54th Street and was a car showroom that was converted into a museum. I'm encouraged by the crassness of that neon sign on the right that says museum. So inside, it was a typical Art Deco uh, environment, but unusual in that the walls are covered with gray velour. There are these overscaled benches where one could sit and, in fact, lie down. Uh, very subdued lighting and music being piped in, uh, typically music by Bach. If you knew the Rob Robert Rosenblum, the great art uh, historian, he said to me once, this was by far the craziest thing happening in New York, and it was odd even for him to go there. But it had a kind of audience and made shows uh, with artists that Hilla Rabe was interested in. And Mr. Guggenheim amassed this very large collection based on her advice. In 1948, the family bought the beginnings of this property on Fifth Avenue. This is the site where we are today between 88th and 89th Street. 
on Fifth Avenue, and the museum moved into a converted apartment building here at 1071, which is the postal address today. And that museum was operative for eight years at that site before it was torn down. In the 1940s, this is Hilla Rebay with one of her characteristically subdued hats. She, in 1943, she'd written to Frank Lloyd Wright saying, could you build us a temple for art, which was very much up his ambitious alley. And I can say, after having lived in Pittsburgh for so long, that Wright uh, had a great penchant in attaching himself to an overly wealthy family decade by decade. The Kaufmans were bled by him all during the 1930s, and the Guggenheims were bled by him all during the 1940s and early 1950s. He made 16 complete sets of drawings for the Guggenheim Museum, and each of which had to be supported by great financial resources. Here you can see Mrs. Re Miss Rebay with Mr. Guggenheim and Frank Lloyd Wright, neither of whom would live to see the museum built. Uh, an astonishing building, unlike anything else that had been presented as a cultural center. In 1949, when his uncle died, Harry Frank Guggenheim became the chairman of the board, and he slowed down the development of the building on Fifth Avenue in response to the inflation after World War II, so that the museum actually took much longer to construct than it might have. So from 1943 to 1959, Frank Lloyd Wright is working fairly consistently on the project. In, uh, in 1949, after uh, Solomon Guggenheim died, Miss Rebay was let go unceremoniously, and this great art historian, James Johnson Sweeney, became the director of the museum, and it became known as the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, no longer the pretense of deep connection and non-objective painting. The museum began making shows of sculpture. Miss Rebay felt that sculpture was not really art. And so she, there were no sculptures in the collection prior to that. But Johnson, uh, Sweeney, was a great friend of Brancusi and called her and brought in wonderful objects to the collection from an early moment. So here in 1951 is the beginning of the destruction along Fifth Avenue to make this building possible. You see to the right that apartment building I showed you previously. We're looking at 89th Street here. And now, with the site completely cleared, the beginning of this unusual building being put up, uh, sp concrete sprayed onto forms, unlike anything else that had been attempted until then. Wright had been thinking about this form since the mid-1920s when he was commissioned by a collector of automobiles outside Washington to build a museum for automobiles that he embellished by inserting a planetarium in the middle of the building. This was called the Gordon Strong Automotive Collection. And in research for that building, he'd studied Bauhaus garages uh, in Germany and elsewhere. And I think this form had been in his mind for the previous 25 years as he thought about what an organic museum could be. Prior to this, I think you'd have to say that almost every art museum was either some manifestation of a palace or a Beaux-Arts ideal for a congregation. Here we're looking at a completely democratized idea of people, as you'll see shortly, walking up a ramp, unlike any other space that had been previously home to a museum, encountering one another and uh, looking at art very differently as well. I can't defend Frank Lloyd Wright ideas about art. He, in fact, wanted no natural light in the building. He wanted it to be pink on the outside and brown on the inside. And every drawing that he made for those 16 years really featured a tapestry-like thing on the wall that was really one of his drawings. So even though he'd been a collector, of, a great collector of Japanese prints, he had a high hostility to contemporary art and really had an inability to imagine how it could operate in this building. It's Sweeney who made the building really succeed by introducing all the things that have become characteristic of it now. So there's Wright's almost final drawing. Uh, what's interesting is that you'll see a car going into the middle of the museum as it did for the first 18 months. So his obsession with automobiles continued even after the building was put up. 
and you could drive into this Port Cochere, let off your passengers and go back to 89th Street. Remember the Fifth Avenue was two ways in these days. So here we are in 1958 under construction and at its finish in 1959. Very lambasted by critics, heavily criticized by people in the neighborhood and nonetheless incredibly popular from day one. An astonishing sight uh, likened to a washing machine or all kinds of mechanical similes. So here we are in 1959 at the opening and you can see how with Sweeney's help the museum had gone considerably beyond abstraction. You see a great Medigliani here on the first ramp. And the building was attractive to people from day one. This is October 1, 1959, with 6,000 visitors at its very beginning. And here's how it looked. Astonishing, it's still astonishing today. Wright's insistence on the incorporation of nature in the building still distinguishes it with the small fountain down below. And, sort of Babylonian gardens on every level. Uh, the next director is the man in the middle, Tom Messer, who came in 1961 and really guided the museum as it became known as an outpost of advanced European art. This is Jean Dubuffet on his left at the time of a, one of his three retrospectives at the Guggenheim over Mr. Messer's long tenure. And I just thought I'd show then the museum's eventual development in the 70s and 80s as a site for other than abstraction and for very advanced European art, Lichtenstein's retrospective and Mario Merz's retrospective. Two important changes in the 1980s. My predecessor, Tom Krenz, came in 1988. He was able to persuade Count Panza de Buomo to sell and give about 500 minimalist objects to the collection. So we have now probably the most important collection of severely minimalist work from the period 1965 to about 1979 in the collection. And further, he convinced the estate of Robert Maplethorpe to give 200 choice photographs from Maplethorpe's estate to the museum with an endowment. And at that moment, the museum began collecting photography as well. In at the very end of her life in the late 1970s, Peggy Guggenheim, who had not really gotten along well with her uncle Solomon, and nor did she like the building on Fifth Avenue, decided reluctantly that her collection, which had been built up from the 1930s onwards, would be subsumed inside the foundation. So I'm showing you this beautiful Claire Falkenstein gate, which is a side entry into the Peggy Guggenheim collection, now part of the foundation, fiduciarily and materially. Peggy is Solomon Guggenheim's niece. Uh, her father died uh, in the sinking of the Titanic. She was uh, considered one of the poor Guggenheims because her father wasn't around to be a partner in the operation. But she was a very aggressive collector and dealer. As you probably know, had a great gallery in Paris and then in London and subsequently, thanks to Hitler, back in New York, where she was the patron to most of the principal artists who we now consider the great practitioners of abstract expressionism, principally Jackson Pollock, whom she owned many paintings by and really paid for his life for quite a long period. She was uh, married frequently, an unhappy person, but many collectors are. Anyway, at the end of her life, by taking over this disused palace on the Grand Canal, she really found a very happy moment for the last chapter of her life and became friendly with young artists uh, in Italy and all through Europe and began inviting the public into this palazzo and receiving people, principally in the summer, uh, young artists, writers, poets, to make it into a creative center. So when it came to the museum, and these are examples of the things that are in the collection, there are about 600 objects altogether, and we show about 200 at any given time in this relatively small space, and it attracts about 475,000 visitors now. It's the third most visited site in Venice, which itself is the most visited place in the world, 18 million visitors annually in a city of 65,000. But we, at this site, are able to show a complement to 15th through 19th century Venice by showing people uh, 
principal examples of what happened in advanced culture after 1920. So that's the site on the Grand Canal. Many of you have been there. It's a wonderful place with a garden behind it. Uh, this peculiar looking elevation on the canal. Remember that this is only the first floor of what should have been a four-story four palazzo. So it's a very truncated building, but works well for us. Inside, the remnants of the way it was used by her. In my opinion, not enough remnants, and we're hopeful of changing that so that it really begins to take on her personality again in the future. And we have four exhibitions there a year. And an acquisitions program that's relatively modest but meant to complement things that are already in the collection. In the late 1990s, the Basque government came to Tom Krenz and the leadership of the museum and suggested that Bilbao, which until then was probably one of the less visited cities in continental Europe, become the site for a Guggenheim Museum, which eventually was an agreement that was made uh, in 1992. Because I lived in Pittsburgh and I was a fan of Chiitas, I went there in 1993 to uh, meet with Chiita, but also to see what was going on in Bilbao at the behest of the mayor of Pittsburgh. And I went, and it was gruesome getting there, and it was gruesome visiting it. Very illegible city, you know, in using the Basque language, they're really turning their backs on anybody else other than themselves. And at that moment, it was really very monolingual, very Basque oriented. And I came back and I made a tour of the foundations of the building, looked around. And I said to the mayor in Pittsburgh, because we were building the Andy Warhol Museum, and I said, don't worry, it'll never get built, and no one will ever go there if it is built. Instead, when this opened in 1997, it's been a perpetual attraction. In a city of one million people, it has about 950,000 visitors annually. Frank Geary made this astonishing building, which is on the banks of the Nervion River, which is a tidal river coming up from the Bay of Biscay. This was a very heavily industrialized city, really the center of steel making and shipbuilding in northern Spain. The city now, through this initiative and others, has converted itself into being not only a tourist magnet, but a kind of intellectual and research center. Very, very savvy uh, investment on the part of the local government. And the building, as you probably know if you've been there, and even if you haven't, is recognized by most architectural connoisseurs as probably the most important structure of the second half of the 20th century. So Frank, in some ways, put real life into a place that was otherwise very introverted and quite moribund, in my opinion. You see the Jeff Koons puppy. The collection there has about 100 objects in it. And they, the government still invests about five and a half to seven million dollars a year in building the collection. So it goes on being a cooperative agreement between the regional government of Biscaya, the city of Bilbao, and the Guggenheim Foundation. I wanted to show these night shots because that's when the museum really shimmers and becomes a very illuminated space. Bilbao is, like Pittsburgh, just located in this very uh, acute valley. And what's interesting, like Pittsburgh, is you can go, you look up and you can see greenery at the top of the hill. Down at the bottom, of course, it's all the ruins of a great industrial city. And I can say that uh, the 12 miles from this site to the bay are now being completely redeveloped with projects by Zaha Hadid and other great architects. And there it is from above. With these very unusual interior spaces, some of which at first view seem to be somewhat hostile to art, but I think now the Geary Building has been a real stretcher, and people see space, museum space, very differently. This is the room that's about the size of a, of a football field. It's 100 yards long, now completely occupied by Richard Serra in this great piece called A Matter of Time, which has special poignancy in a steel-making city. At the same time, but without consulting the Basque, my predecessor was making a deal with Deutsche Bank to occupy this 
late 19th century, early 20th century bank on Unter der Linden in Berlin. It's their Berlin headquarters. Uh, the deal eventually culminated in a 5,000 square foot gallery on, in what had previously been the teller space at the bank, designed by Richard Gluckman. What's interesting about this arrangement, which is terminating next year, uh, is that the bank pays for all the expenses of four exhibitions annually, one or two of which is commissioned by the museum so that an artist occupies the 5,000 square feet. Here you see the great Japanese photographer, Sugimoto, and the museum takes half of the things that the artist makes into its collection, all paid for by the bank. So it's been an unusual and enriching relationship for us with Deutsche Bank. When you're in Berlin, ask for Deutsche Guggenheim. It's on the way to Museum Island, and it's near the Adlon. We show the collection, and then we have these commission shows as well. Here, Jeff Koons made a series of paintings, half of which came into the collection. Finally, I thought I'd share with you uh, this most ambitious alliance, which is now about five and a half years old with the government of Abu Dhabi. If you're like me, you don't quite know where Abu Dhabi is, and you certainly don't know where it is in relation to places like Dubai, which you may have heard of or even visited. United Arab Emirates, which you see on this map, is a, a federation of seven cities. Uh, the most famous of which is Dubai. The, Abu Dhabi is the government uh, center for this country, which was founded in 1971. It now has discovered to be the home for 10% of the world's petroleum reserves, so it's a very well-to-do place. And its leadership is interested, until recently at least, in integrating that their society into the most advanced of Western society. So you see very small territory, basically surrounded by Saudi Arabia, which is not necessarily a friendly place, and Oman, which is a very friendly place. Then we read about uh, Shia Sunni problems in Bahrain, which is very nearby and troubling to the UAE. If the government of Bahrain changes, it becomes pro-Iranian, which is against their best wishes. And the Persian Gulf, of course, is the animating body of water at the site. Abu Dhabi City would be comparable to a very fancy big Clayton, I would say. So it's a city that's about 35 years old. It's a number of 30 to 50 story shiny skyscrapers. There is now a big effort to make it greener and more pedestrian friendly, but we have to be honest that it's a very difficult environment, sometimes exceeding 130 degrees in the summertime and a very humid environment also. So you're on the water and it's warm, but it's wet and warm and extremely difficult if you don't like sun in particular. Uh, this, so you see downtown Abu Dhabi there. There was a 21 mile island directly to the north that they gave the felicitous name of Sadiat, which means happiness in Arabic. And that's meant to be the cultural district eventually home to about 350,000 people. And what today there's a golf course, of, naturally, and about 50 villas on the site and a new 10-lane bridge that takes people from downtown Abu Dhabi to Sadiat. The master plan calls for uh, a number of museums. So at the bottom, sort of isolated out into the water, you see Frank Geary's sketch for Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. Above that, in a turned over half shell, is uh, Jean Nouvel's building for Guggenheim Louvre. This will be the first time the Louvre is making a branch outside France. Next to that, a performing arts center designed by Zaha Hadid, a maritime museum, then there's that bridge. And in the middle of this, which isn't revealed in this drawing, a big Norman Foster designed uh, National History Museum being done in consultation with the British Museum in London. So in fact, there are three cultural partners active, Guggenheim, Louvre, British Museum. And you can see this aspiration for an interesting residential district that fronts directly onto the water. There it is from above. That's the Louvre, the white space. We're the very agitated thing on top. 
This was one of Frank's early models of how to mass the institution and also think about its circulation. It's uh, approximately 450,000 square feet. It's 21 stories high. And uh, as you'll see in a minute, now it's taken this shape. So this is the actual entryway. Uh, there are nine of these beautiful cylindrical cones, and they offer an opportunity for us to engage with artists by making commissions and public spaces. And then altogether, there are 16 other galleries, a library, two restaurants, all the typical things that one has to do these days to attract people. So there it is from the city side, one looking out to it from the park that will connect the Louvre to the Guggenheim. And finally, from the actual downtown Abu Dhabi, the view. So you can imagine this is a very big financial and in some ways political commitment by the leadership of the United Arab Emirates. It's been, for me, a little guy from Kansas City, an interesting uh, experience in dealing with people who have uh, somewhat different backgrounds than my own. And uh, I, we fortify ourselves in a long conversation with our partners around the world in saying that we truly believe that culture offers the future a great platform for unlikely people to come together, inquisitive people, and talk about things in a way that we think can be especially constructive for the 21st century. So that's our rationale. Those are all the sites. You see the family of the Guggenheims. I tried to give you a little information about the Guggenheim family. I hope you'll visit in New York on November 10. We have Maurizio Catalan's retrospective called All, which will be relatively radical in its presentation. And if you're in New York in the next two and a half weeks, this BMW Guggenheim Lab is a very interesting temporary structure at Houston and First, next to Second Avenue, in a thing that was built by Atelier Bauwau Bow wow from Tokyo, and will now go on to Berlin uh, later this year and after that to Mumbai. We've made a deal with BMW that we'll do nine cities around the world over a six-year period in offering these sites on the street where people get to talk about architecture. But because it's on the street, in a certain kind of street, we don't use the word architecture. The theme for this cycle is comfort because everybody's an expert and it's so integrally linked to the notion of architecture. We thought that with the modern and all the other opportunities in New York, it didn't make sense for us to keep presenting models and drawings inside Frank Lloyd Wright's building, but rather to go out into the public and listen to people's ideas about architecture. So it's another demonstration of that idea of using our subject and incorporating lots of people's points of view into it in an effort to really have a rich and fruitful dialogue towards the future. We were lucky the BMW thought that was an interesting idea, so it's turned out to be not only uh, very beautifully uh, executed, but almost too popular. We're having 1,400 people a day visit the site, and we're predicting in Mumbai we'll have 7,000 people a day. So we're getting ready for that high degree of popularity. Now, Paul suggests that I answer questions if there are any. Let me say, uh, let me say something. I, it's not a question; it's a statement. I think you, who live here, should be tremendously forceful and proud of your deep investment in culture. You've done it almost as no other city that's on the wrong side of the growth curve has done. I and living in Pittsburgh, I can all those years I can say we look to St. Louis often as a model, and so I think uh, one of the challenges for all of us is to insert that reality into the narrative about the country's future. The leadership of the country has to understand that this, these kinds of investments are the ones that really pay off well and have uh, great possibilities for encouraging unlikely people to enter into mainstream living in a good way. And that there's creative people
really are the very easiest and softest investment the public monies can make. So I'm happy to be here. I'll be next door tomorrow as well. I know the museum's in a great moment of expansion. But truly, I think St. Louis offer, should offer itself as a great national model. So when I was a kid, I thought I'd go into politics. And that's a kind of good beginning to a lot of different things, I suppose. But I do realize when I look back that living in Kansas City, we lived in the old part. So I saw a planned city, and I was frequently at the Nelson, even though I didn't want to be. And then uh, the Art Institute, where I'd walk around and ride my bike, and I'd start smelling turpentine. And I think subliminally, I realized that these so-called unusual people in the 50s weren't so unusual, they're sort of attractive. Then when I, in 1968, I realized politics wasn't really an option. Do you remember Stuart Symington? So I worked for him in Washington for a long, for four years. And then in 68, I realized this is, you know, we, we, I'd hit a roadblock, so I moved to France. And then I began looking at pictures more and thinking that, and I do believe this, that art is a kind of parallel to politics and has a different timetable and a different set of expectations, but they're intermeshed sometimes in their aspirations. So that's a long answer. I grew up looking at interesting Edwardian buildings in a planned city with a couple of paintings nearby, and then I realized I like being around artists. And if I could draw and add and subtract, I would have become an architect, but I couldn't do any of those. Let me tell you, let me, yeah, let me share that idea. So we're buying art for Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. It's a six-person committee. There are eight person now, four representatives from Abu Dhabi, and then I got to join up and bring in three other people. And the budget, you know, it's a fant fantasy budget. So, and of course, we're very keen on commissioning artists. And, and then I, I'm not giving you the details, but in the museum itself, there'll be a very extensive uh, collection of Arabic modernism beginning in the 1920s. Not from Abu Dhabi, because there really was very little there, but rather from Syria and Cairo and Tunis and Beirut in particular, and Iran. So we're interested in being a regional center, of course, and uh, as you can see from the plans of the building, it's very, very ambitious. Labor in Abu Dhabi is imported, principally from Southeast Asia, as you say, and uh, not always un under the best conditions. In fact, I'd say frequently not good conditions. We imagined at one moment there'd be 20,000 men working on this project 24 hours a day to build the three museums. It's a little slower than we once imagined, but there is a work camp, Workers Village, that now houses 8,000 men in air-conditioned, clean, and religiously uh, correct environment. Because just because I'm Muslim doesn't mean that I can eat coming from one area what another Muslim might eat. So diet, in many ways, controls where people are in the village. There are four mosques. There's a big athletic facility. Uh, a number of artists, led by Walid Rod, uh, proposed or accused the Guggenheim of being involved in exploitation of labor, and Human Rights Watch substantiated that point of view. So, of course, we had to become more activist. I had already gone to this workers' camp several times. I go every time I'm in Abu Dhabi. The principal reform that was called for is an independent monitor, so that if you're a worker on this site, you could, you're free to speak to somebody to talk about conditions, where your passport is, is your money being sent home? Because these are men who aren't able to go back home for long stretches. So the money's being sent to Bangladesh to keep their family alive, but they're not able to travel. And previously, sometimes passports were taken away, et cetera. And worse than that, very big recruitment fee. So you would pay the person who brought you from Bangladesh to Abu Dhabi the equivalent of almost eight or nine months wages which is a lot of money. 
Now I can say that their Price Waterhouse Cooper has been hired to be an independent monitor. We've had uh, in the last two weeks a much better relationship with Human Rights Watch, and we we're back in closer discussions with artists. I assume there'll be a change in the boycott, but it was, as you say, a complete reprise of the 1960s for me. Yeah, much more complicated now because I'm on the other side of the table. Well, the one artist I've had a really long relationship with is Richard Archfogger. And because we have the same initials, we call each other major and minor. So he's now a certain age, he's 87 this year, and he's changing. But he just, this summer, up in Dutchess County, showed some new drawings. And earlier in the year, by accident, I was in Chicago, and he had a show of new drawings there. And he's a guy who just keeps on going. And I almost never know where he's headed. And it's still true today. But through him, I'd say, beginning in 1974, I've learned a lot about what it is to be a complicated person. And that's a great privilege. That's sort of one of the biggest privileges in being in the job. You know, it's a little like politics also in that I have to wake up every morning and raise money. So I'm sort of dialing for dollars the way your congressman is for different purposes. And therefore, when you get to be around the curators, the artists, sometimes the collectors, never the critics, there's a lot to be learned in seeing how people are, you know, repositioning contemporary culture. This weekend I was in Williamstown because we had this group called the Asian Art Advisory Council. So we brought 12 people in from Asia and we talked about what's the responsibility of contemporary culture, North American in relation to Asia and now vice versa as well. So it was two and a half days of very interesting and provocative. Uh, you know, it's one of, the, one of those great luxuries where you get to think. I didn't really get to think, but I got to listen. But I'd say Richard Archfogger. There are many others. I mean, there were no bad experiences. There were experiences that I wasn't ready for. But there were no bad experiences. Audience expectation is directly parallel to TV use and newspaper and television use. So my group is still oriented to going somewhere, looking at something, kind of having an opinion, maybe reading a label or two and being content and having, you know, participated to that level. Whereas people, and the younger they get, the more aggressive they are, really feel that it's our obligation to take into account their perception of what they've seen. So we've become social media extraordinaire. I think we're the second or third biggest in Facebook, Twitter, Foursquare, all that stuff. And really it's more than we can deal with practically. But we've learned a lot about it in the Catalan show for the first time ever. There'll be no labels, only apps. So you'll be looking at everything in a new way. And there's an e-catalog and a print catalog. So the day is coming, I see, where the museum will have these two parallel distribution systems. And I reckon for a long time it'll be broken down by age and expectation. But uh, we have other experiments beyond the BMW Guggenheim lab that we're thinking about doing that would be temporary congregations of people. And in that, we're trying to demonstrate a physical reality to that same sort of exchange and value of opinion, both in Europe and here as well. So we're, we realize that, yes, site for contemplation, yes, maybe a site for education, I hope a place where you can dream but beyond that, a place where a lot of opinions are going to be tossed around very freely. And you have to be willing to accept that, filter through them, and make the best of it. It's not a museum where we have the capacity for accommodating very many more people. We're sort of at the limit. So online is a parallel experience that has some value. And then being in other sites is especially helpful. We, the question is, how do we add to the collection? And the answer is uh, opportunistically and with very limited capital. So the Guggenheim looks like a great big deal, but it doesn't have any money in the bank. They forgot to tell me that when I was being interviewed. And as you may know, the market is quite uh, crowded at present. So we've just put together a council and we're thinking about
how we can participate in buying things that are made before 1995 because most recently that's really been the chronological limit. It's been consistent involvement with young artists, which I like, but we need also to be cognizant of the Kandinsky world, artists in the mid-century and make a much richer and I hope deeper collection. So the old ideas of owning numbers of pieces by single artist will still be operative. It's never gonna be like the modern, a great collection that's broad-based. It's very focused and we'll also be more aggressive about buying from around the world. Again, there have been moments when the collection drifted off that way, but it hasn't been consistent enough. We use the word transnational. Our friends in Asia said stop saying that this weekend, and it, it's not attractive as a word. So we're trying to figure out a different way of what we need is a filter that really accommodates the whole globe in an informed way. Uh, I think it's important in these, for example, in these Asian Art Council discussions, we heard a lot of resistance, particularly from the Chinese, about you know, cherry picking out thing, artists and art from contemporary society. So I think it's largely a question of uh, ethics and willingness to listen. Turn over your idea of monolith and think about it instead as an interconnected series of stages. So we could also say that it's monolithic in its branding and maybe in its ambitions, but not necessarily in its attitude. So what we're trying to make it into is a series of interconnected stages that might be monolithic in one way only. If you're wandering around in the world, not just on the IRT, you can get out and say, oh, Guggenheim, I can trust them to either upset me or calm me or provoke me or at least allow me to have an experience with art. It's a strangely universal word, Guggenheim. Thank you all very much.